Okay, time for more of your questions. Of course, anytime you want to do, just go on to anywhere on the YouTube comments, on any video, just post a question. I'll go through, find my favorites, and answer them here. So let's get started. Jay Barsic, what camera do you use? I'm using a Canon 5D Mark II. That's a 2470 lens on the front of the camera, also made by Canon. I've got a Sennheiser uh, EW100 G3 wireless audio that's sending the audio to the camera. And we've gone through a lot of iterations. I've tried different cameras and different audio setups and lenses, and this is sort of our happy place right now. But the camera, all the Canon cameras will turn themselves off at the when you need them. So they're not to be trusted. And uh, there's a great video of Casey Neistat taking an ax to one of his. So I've wanted to take an ax to mine as well. It's like literally the best camera out of a range of ones that suck, but it still is, is not great. So that's, that's what I use. Adam Shupp, if we were to colonize Mars and whatnot, what do you think the internet would be like? Would a copy of the internet have to be made on Mars to lower download times? If we had actual colonists on Mars living there, we would have to maintain some kind of copy of the internet because the latency between Earth and Mars is measured in, can be measured in tens of minutes. So there would probably be like a whole copy of the internet on Earth and then some way that it gets duplicated over on Mars, but then bandwidth is gonna be expensive. So you're not gonna be able to play a first person shooter with your friends back on Earth. You're gonna be able to get news, you know, depends, sometimes eight minutes, 10 minutes late, sometimes 20 minutes late. Uh, and big information sites will be transferred, but there's gonna be a copy on Mars and there's gonna be a copy on Earth. And times when Earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the sun, they can't communicate directly, the internet, your internet signal is gonna to have to bounce off some other satellite that's in some other part of the solar system. So it could take a very long time if you request a web page for when it shows up from Earth to Mars. Skip Slater. Can you make the camera more shaky, please? There you go, that's pretty shaky. <laughs> so we did an episode, uh, man, like two years ago about whether light experiences time and we tried carrying the camera to see if it sucked. And it turns out that it sucked. And as you see, we use tripods all the time now. And if we can figure out a way to be able to have it be handheld and a little more fluid, we'll try that. So sorry you didn't like it, uh, we won't do it again. That said, we do experiments all the time. We try new ideas, try new techniques, we see them do something in some show, and we wanna try and figure out how they do it. So I experiment all the time with the camera gear that we use and the audio setup that we do, in the way we organize these shows, and I guarantee that we will try new experiments, the vast majority of which will suck. So that's, that is the future that I promise you. Conan Kun, can someone please explain why jet planes can't just keep going up and up until they exit the Earth? The way jet planes and all airplanes work is through, they use the air to provide lift. And as they move through the air, the difference in pressure between the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing gives them an upward force that allows them to fly up in the air. But that only works as long as you've got an atmosphere. So as soon as you get above where the atmosphere is very thin, you know, pretty much as high or a little higher than where planes currently fly today, wings don't work. And that's why we have to switch to rockets. Now the cool thing is, is that you can use airplane technology on different planets as well. You can use airplanes on Mars even though the atmosphere is very thin. You can use them on Venus where the atmosphere is very thick. It's almost like, like using a, like a, like a boat on, on the, through the atmosphere of Venus. And you can use them on places like Titan. So there are some places in the solar system where jet planes and airplanes will work again, which is pretty exciting. And there's some missions in the works. NASA's working on an airplane concept for Mars that may happen in the future. Maverick Bishop, I have a question for you, Fraser. Would it be possible that the light spectrum can exist in longer than one meter in wavelength? In other words, is it possible for wavelengths of light to be longer than radio waves or even shorter than gamma rays? Thanks. Radio waves and gamma rays are the same thing. They are all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's all about the size of the wavelength. If you have very long waves, that's in the radio spectrum. If you have very short waves, that's in the gamma ray spectrum. But you've got radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, all the colors, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. That is the electromagnetic spectrum and they're all the same thing. It's just that if space itself 
expands, then the wavelength of that light will expand with it. And that changes the color. And so you can change the ultraviolet and visible light that, were the, that was the, the, the first visible light coming out of the Big Bang. And now 13.8 .8 billion years later, it is microwaves. And in the future, it's gonna be radio waves. So you can absolutely have radio waves that are longer than a meter. They could be a light year across. You could have gamma radiation that is smaller and smaller and smaller. It could be the Planck length. And there's no name for bigger than big and no name for smaller than small. It's just radio waves on the one end and gamma rays on the other side. Ben Rubel, do you have any recommendations for things to observe with my eight inch scope? If you've got an eight inch telescope, that is a really great workhorse telescope. That's the point where you can see most of the bright and many of the dim objects in the night sky as long as you've got some pretty good dark skies. You can see all the planets. You can see great features on the moon. Put a filter, you can see in stuff on the sun. You can see nebula, you can see galaxies, you can see clusters. You can, like, I don't have great ideas for you because you can see almost anything with that telescope. And if you take it to the next level and you put a camera onto that telescope, then you can do long exposure imagery and really bring out the details. So. My advice to you is just spend time out, have a star chart of the targets that you want to go after, and just try to observe them one after the other and see if you can see them. And you'll get a sense of what's within your capability and, and what isn't. But an 8-inch telescope is a really great workhorse, medium-sized telescope. I, I don't have a telescope that big. I would love to, so I'm, I'm definitely a little jealous. So good. Uh, take lots of pictures and uh, see what you can get with it. Stupid Addy. Here's something that's been bothering me for a while. If aliens exist in the early universe, would they be able to observe us? When we look out into space, we are looking back in time. So when we see 100 light years away, we are seeing 100 years ago. And so for aliens, if they live 100 light years away from us, they're seeing what the Earth looked like 100 years ago, right? So if the aliens lived 65 million Year, light years away from us. Like right now today, if they are just in a galaxy 65 million light years away in some other galaxy, they're going to see the dinosaurs on Earth. So they wouldn't, so what's important is, is that the further away we get from Earth, the further back in time we're seeing, we're seeing, if we see an alien civilization, we have to remember that we are seeing what they looked like backwards in time. If we spot evidence of Dyson spheres in a whole other galaxy, that civilization existed millions of years ago, which is kind of amazing. So that's sort of how it would work, how we can observe the aliens and how they can observe us. Yoda. What created the things that created the Big Bang? We don't know. We just don't know. And any way to know what came before the Big Bang is going to require some kind of evidence of the thing that came before the Big Bang finding its way into the universe as we have right now. And it might be that we can never know that we, there are certain answers that we will never be able to have adequate scientific data to tell us what was the, what is the answer. So for a lot of the time, the answer to so many of these questions just has to be, I don't know. And I'm happy to say, I don't know. Let's find out. And if anyone tells you that they do know, then you have to find out, you just have to say, how do you know? What is your evidence that this is what happened? And if they can't give you good enough evidence, then the answer just has to be, I don't know. Paul Sheeran, hate to be that guy, but most of the clown balloon animal helium is produced by alpha decay of radioactive elements like uranium and thorium. At least until the clowns start mining deep space for primordial helium. Paul, you're exactly right. I got two mistakes in that video where I talked about all of the primordial helium being used by clowns. I think the first one is what you said, which is in fact a lot of the helium we find on Earth is produced by this radioactive decay. The second thing is that all the clowns I've ever seen, when they make those balloon animals, they just use their own air and then they breathe out the balloon and they roll it up. So I was wrong on two counts for that video. Alfonso Mugisha, how is it that we can see light from the universe when this light was created so long ago? Shouldn't the light have been destroyed by now? The only thing that's going to destroy the light, or not destroy it, but absorb the photons of the light is if it runs into something. So the really amazing thing is that the light that we're seeing, we're picking up on our detectors, 
the, the microwave radiation from the afterglow of the Big Bang has been traveling uninterrupted for 13.8 billion years. And during that time, the universe has expanded from what used to be a very small region to one that is 92, 91 billion light years across. It's just mind bending to think that that light was able to just keep going and keep going and keep going. And finally, after all that time, it bounced into your eyeball. And that's what killed it. And by kill it, I mean it absorbed the photon. So that's, it's amazing to think about that. That's what it means for this light to move. And what we're seeing when we're seeing back in time, millions and even billions of light years away. Astonishing. Charles Cook. Here's another question. How do you think our technology will evolve and what do you think it will be like in the future? I like to imagine technology in the future, but I also sort of feel like it's pointless to try and imagine too far in advance what technology is going to look like. I mean, you look at our phones, you look at some of the technologies that we have. When we watch Star Trek, we never thought we would have these things in our lifetimes, and yet we do. In fact, they're better than some of the things that they had in Star Trek. So. I think the more useful way of predicting what the future is going to hold is just by looking at energy expenditure, energy use. And this is what the whole point of the Kardashev scale is, is that if you just take our current energy usage and you just scale it up and up and up and up, we will want to use more and more energy. And eventually, certain kinds of energy will have to come online. We will run out of renewable resources. We will have to switch to fusion. We'll have, we'll have used up all of the, the renewable or on and fusion on Earth, and we're going to have to build a Dyson Sphere, and then eventually we're going to have to enclose all the stars in Dyson Spheres. So I don't really know what specific future technologies are going to be, but I feel pretty safe to just keep watching that rise in energy usage and know that we will come up with technologies and power sources that will supply it. Dylan Nunes, when you say the universe, do you mean the observable universe or the whole universe? Kind of curious. So when I say the universe, it's really a shorthand for the observable universe, because that's the only universe that we can really make any, any answers about, because that's all we can see. We don't know whether the universe that we can see, the observable universe, is the size of the actual full universe, or whether it's just this tiny pocket in a much, much, much larger finite universe, or a tiny pocket in an infinite universe. And we just don't know. And so when I say the universe, I'm saying the observable universe. And I'll try to be specific if I'm saying the, like the larger universe or the, the universe outside the observable universe, but that's the shorthand is the universe. Okay, well, another week, another question show. Thanks to everyone who sent in your questions. As always, just go ahead and put in your question in the YouTube comments for any video that you're watching and whether it has anything to do with the video or not or on the, in, this, uh, in this QA, that would be fine too. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and go ahead and leave a like if you enjoyed this video. All right, we'll see you next week.